Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Accessibility Advisory Committee. This is the first meeting of this group um, as it's as it's formed, so it's been a very long time. I think this is the fall since we've all been together. So thank you, everyone, for, for coming today. <clears throat> the first item on the agenda is the election of the chair and vice chair. Um, so I just would like to open up the floor for nominations for chair of the committee. Are there any nominations for chair? Um, this position is for the uh, a one year period, so it's for 2023. And I believe uh, Catherine was the chair last term. If Catherine would like to do it again, I'd like to nominate her. She's been really good as this is Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. And is there a seconder for that nomination? Andy? <clears throat> Great. Uh, Catherine, are you interested in being chair again? You know what? I'm very honored to be nominated again. <laughs> I really appreciate that, Brooke and uh, Andy. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if the committee is comfortable with that, I would certainly stay on as chair if, if you would like me to. Okay, great. Were there any other nominations for chair? Okay. Can I have a nomination to, uh, sorry, a uh, motion to close nominations? Andy, thank you. Okay, based on Catherine's response, uh, you are acclaimed chair of the committee for 2023. Are there any nominations for vice chair of the committee? I'll, I'd like to nominate um, Christina. <laughs> She's putting a cup up to her head. <laughs> Are there any, is there a seconder for that nomination? I think Councillor Matrasovs. Christina, would you like to let your name stand for vice chair? I mean, I'm, I, I guess I attend most meetings, but I mean, if there's somebody else that's uh, more interested, about that, that's okay too. Okay, well, we'll let your name stand for now and I'll, I'll ask if there's any other, if there are any other nominations for, for vice chair. My rule always was if Dwight couldn't do it, I, the meeting was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seeing none, um, is there a motion to close nominations? I can do that as Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. <clears throat> All right, Christina, you are acclaimed as vice chair for uh, 2023 of the committee. And just before I pass it over to you, Chair Schultz, <clears throat> We have Andrew Rodriguez here today um, and Randy Scherzer to speak to the Rockwood Terrace site plan. And I just wondered um, if we'd be able, if the committee was agreeable, if we could move that presentation up to the, the first item on the, on the agenda. But I will pass it over to you now and, and okay. take it from there. Yes, I have no objection to moving it up on the agenda. Um, does anyone else have any objections to that? Okay, it doesn't appear. Um, so Andrew, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Rodriguez and I'm a project manager with Colliers and the owner's rep for the Rockwood Terrace Long-Term Care Redevelopment and Campus of Care Project. As part of this session this afternoon, I'll be handing over very shortly to uh, Deborah Wadsworth, who is a senior project manager and senior architect from the prime consulting team with Casian. Um, there's also some other members from the design team here today. Um, and you'll be getting an overview of um, the site, the site plan, the various components that have been planned as part of the Rockwood Terrace Campus of Care. And uh, we'll certainly be happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have following the presentation. So without further ado, I will hand over to Deborah to uh, share a copy of the presentation and run through the uh, the presentation with the group this afternoon. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, uh, I'm Deborah Wadsworth. As, as Andrew mentioned, I'm from Kazian and uh, I will start to share my screen. Um, feel free to um, 
ask questions. Uh, I may not be, when I'm sharing my screen, I may not be able to, um, oh, it's okay, someone else is sharing the screen. Uh, I may not be able to see uh, raised hands, but um, just uh, shout out if you have any questions. Um, am I able to advance the slides here, Sarah? Uh, no, I'm able to advance them at your direction, or I can stop sharing and allow you to share the slides if that's your preference. It might be better if I um, can share my screen and um, just give me a second here, please. There we go. And uh, are you able to see a screen? Yeah. It says Rockwood Terrace Campus of Care. Okay, great. Um, so, Thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, present today. Also uh, with me here is Ted Handy from Ted Handy Associates Architects in Barry. Um, Akazian and, and Ted Handy's office are, are partnering in the design of this, um, of this long-term care home and assisted living uh, development and village square for Gray County. So um, there's there are a lot of people behind uh, this design and, and all of the work that you're going to see here um, on the design time uh, on the design team we have uh, Kazian and Ted's office as I mentioned we also have um, many engineers and, and designers with healthcare and long-term care uh, experience and um, some of the design has been informed by the research of Dr. Uh, Pat Armstrong from uh, York University and uh, of course, we're doing this on behalf of, of Gray County and, uh, and their project manager Colliers. So starting, I'll start with the precinct. Um, if you are familiar with the location of the current Rockwood Terrace uh, long-term care home, this new project or the new building will be located immediately south of it. Um, there's a large berm with uh, that's treed behind the long-term care home. And this, this, this site is right behind that, that berm and it will be um, uh, 128 bed long-term care home plus 40 units of assisted living and a village square component. And I'll talk about that in, in a bit more detail, but this is uh, what I'm showing on the screen is an overview of, of the relationship of the new site in the context of the existing long-term care home and the high school beside it. So this is what the um, site looks like right now is from one perspective. It's um, pretty rough in terms of topography. There is a path that's been made through it through by ATVs and pedestrian traffic, but largely it's um, some, you know, um, coniferous trees and bits of scrubby grass. Um, and it is adjacent to the, uh, the quarry lands immediately south. And over the past 16 months, we've been working to develop um, a building. Uh, it has, um, uh, you know, it's, it has a, a significant presence uh, in terms of- um, No, I'm just civic. listening. So I, I don't really know any of the documents. Was there an address or, or sorry, a question? Nope. Wait, mm -hmm. This is the uh, proposed site plan um, and, it, you know, just a, a closer up view of the, of the specific site to the long-term care home. And immediate uh, on the south end, there's this turquoise rectangle is the village square. And this, um, the village square is, will be uh, personal services, business, um, small shops, cafe uh, type of building. And it's intended to and you know, enrich and create convenient access to some services for the residents, visitors, and staff uh, that will be on the site. Um, the center part, which is almost squarish, is what we call the long-term care core. And it has on one side, the, the main entrance to the building and at the back, um, the building services pieces, the, the site kitchen, the um, receiving area, the garbage, the staff change rooms and, and staff areas. And then to the north in, the, in this, well, in one part of it, it's like a big donut with a, with a courtyard in the center and, and extending wigs is the resident home area, which is where the resident rooms 
um, and, uh, and care support spaces will be located. Um, what you don't see in the site plan is the assisted living because it's on the third floor above the uh, resident uh, home area, but the main entrance is right beside the long-term care um, entrance on site off of Rock Street. So the, um, the long-term care and assisted living entrances will face Rock Street and the Village Square will face South Street, which is an existing street that currently goes to Elgin, but it will be extended across through the site. Um, this is a close up, a uh, bit more um, detail around the Village Square. Um, there has been a, a lot of design consideration in terms of um, mobility access, um, in terms of um, uh, sidewalk access, curb cuts at the sidewalk, accessible entrances, automation at entrances, um, and then um, covered, covered canopies um, at the entrances as well. And wayfinding in terms of um, both intuitive wayfinding with respect to a, like a larger canopy at the main entrance, um, as well as more overt uh, wayfinding with signage at each shop. The main entrance to the long-term care and assisted living, as I mentioned, is off Rock Street. And um, in, at that entrance, we will have uh, tactile indicators uh, between bollards. So there's a safety element so that vehicles cannot encroach onto the strictly pedestrian area. Um, we will have uh, colored pavers that are aligned in the direction uh, of travel towards the entrance. And um, we also have uh, six barrier-free uh, parking spots at this entrance. And this is a model, so that not all the, all the details around that show in the model, this is an, an earlier one, but this is to give you a sense of the, of the scale um, and the look of the approach to the building. So we have parking at the entrance and we also have parking to the north east corner of this building uh, for staff visitors and, and residents who, um, who would have a vehicle. There's staff parking uh, on the west that's um, associated with the staff entrance. And then there's village square parking. And in all at the front, the staff and the village square parking, we have accessible parking. Um, and we have uh, twice as many barrier-free parking spots allocated uh, as are required by the bylaw for this site. I'll move to the landscape elements. The, the central courtyard, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, serves as the backyard um, for all intents and purposes for the residents, creates um, a nice space for recreational activity, for uh, walking loops, for rest and repose, for socialization. We'll have an accessible dining terrace there, a shade structure. And we're in, currently in the process of, of reviewing and vetting the site furniture options so there will be a combination of fixed furniture and movable furniture, uh, predominantly to account for different groupings of people, um, people using mobility devices and, and just fixed furniture so that um, there is not the risk of having furniture that's moved into the path of travel. On the west, we have a similar uh, open open-sided courtyard, uh, very similar features with um, a covered shade structure. Uh, this one is a little different in that there will be uh, uh, raised garden beds that are uh, accessible uh, for use by residents. Um, and so people will be able to grow their own vegetables or, or herbs or do um, different um, you know, gardening activities in this area. The same, um, design approach uh, exists here as for the center, uh, center courtyard with respect to furniture and a combination of fixed and, and movable and accessible furniture. I should say that the benches, um, in all cases, the seating is, is quite firm and will have a back uh, for support and also handrails. So even in a bench, we'll have um, uh, 
bars so that people can um, have leverage when they're um, to stand or to, and to sit down. At the community uh, level, we have like at the broader, my, by community, I mean outside of the long-term care, um, you know, immediate uh, environs, we have a, a walking trail and a, a seating area adjacent to the West Courtyard that will be open to the public um, to come and sit. It's essentially designed as a, as a feature. So we have the uh, sidewalk uh, that goes around the entire long-term care home for residents who come with a visitor and they have a walking loop around the entire, uh, around the entire site. The idea here is that there's um, very limited access away from the site. So we've created the entire uh, site plan to be accessible. So our challenge there was to create um, something that was, um, you know, accessible in terms of slopes because of the walking trail in particular, uh, we're managing that with um, short uh, bits of ramp and we're, we're trying as much as possible to have no slope greater than 2% across the site. And um, if you recall from the image that I showed you uh, initially, um, there is quite a, uh, a slope on the site. So that's been a bit of a challenge, but um, the combination of uh, extensive grading and ramps, particularly to the north, um, we, we think we can uh, achieve that for the most part. And there's a community plaza on the southeast corner. And this plaza is intended to support the cafe that's inside the village square to the south of the building. And there will be seating there. Um, and as well as uh, um, uh, a, rock, a rock formation, so to speak, which is intended to be recreational for people to sit at or for children to climb on. And this is, of course, to extend the uh, experience of the residents um, to come here with with visitors and and uh, watch you know um, grandchildren children just be part of uh, the broader community. It's intended to be uh, to integrate um, other aspects of the town onto this site and to draw visitors to this place. Inside the village square, um, we have. Uh, uh, a universal washroom that's associated and immediately adjacent to the uh, cafe and eating area. And then we have a central bank of washrooms, uh, which also has accessible washrooms and is more, um, you know, um, the multi, multi washroom style that it, people are familiar with in, in um, plazas like this. I'll take you briefly through the inside of the long-term care home. Um, this is level one. This is a, uh, the, there's a, a, the lounge here has a palette of wood, uh, stone and natural colors, meaning colors that are inspired by nature. Um, and this is to give the, the, the home, a um, kind of a, a, a presence in a sense that is rooted in the natural environment that is, that is, that it is around and Rockwood Terrace is a perfect name for um, the inspiration that came behind this. Um, at the second floor, we have very similar, this, this is uh, showing you what the elements are of the roof garden at the second level. So this is to ensure that in, even in the event of outbreak, every resident has accessible outdoor space. Uh, they don't have to go through another resident home area to access it. They don't even have to go around the building or through the lobby or anything like that. It's, it's literally right at their doorstep. Um, we paid uh, special attention to turning circles in this project. Um, I, I forgot to mention at the, at the beginning uh, uh, in my introduction, I'm currently taking a course uh, to be a site assessor through the Rick Hansen Foundation. And um, for, for much of the last decade, I was the team lead on a project for a hospital that wants to be the most accessible hospital in Canada. And so we encountered a lot of discussions around what mobility access means versus what the code prescription is. And it's, it's largely um, believed and experienced that the code minimums do not actually provide 
mobility, accessibility, except for a small portion of people. So when we look at the five foot turning radius, for example, we did a study for the Ministry of Health that showed that on the site, actually that, that turning circle was only appropriate to 25 to 30% of the population uh, using mobility devices. And so we have um, uh, used that experience plus what we've heard from other care providers in the difficulty of, of having um, a turning radius for a wheelchair and also having a care provider in the room with that person if, if the washroom is designed exactly to the five foot radius. So we have used 1800 as the uh, turning circle in this based on this anecdotal evidence, so to speak, and, and also in our experience with, um, with other projects that are aiming for um, a, a much more accessible uh, environment than what the uh, building code currently provides. So what I'm showing on the screen here are the plans for the private room and the basic room. Um, the, the difference here is that in the basic room, two residents would share uh, a, a washroom that is uh, in the center of their, of their bedroom situated so that they both have separate access. Um, and the, the dotted orange circle is the 1500 or the 1525, which turns into um, a five foot turning radius versus the 1800 diameter turning circle, which is a six foot radius. This is what the uh, private room is looking like. So it's, we've, we've um, tended towards a really neutral palette, again, of natural woods uh, and wood grains. Now this, um, and, a, and a, a wainscoting, um, roller blinds. It's intended to be a very neutral background with the opportunity for residents to bring in their own uh, pictures and things to, to add color accessories, bed accessories, blankets, things like that. The colors and, uh, and that are still under review, but this is what it's, um, the, the direction it's going in. And this is what the basic room looks like. So um, if you recall from the, the slide I showed a little bit ago, it's just a little bit smaller. The door you see on the right hand side is the is a sliding door uh, into the adjacent washroom. And this is what the private resident washroom looks like. So we have um, centered the toilet on a wall with pull down um, uh, grab bars uh, so that there's transfer space on either side. So that is, um, you know, very helpful in the event of someone has had a stroke and one side is is more um, mobile than the other or for staff assists so that there's space for uh, assistance in the room as well. The sinks and the counters are wheelchair accessible. And we also did a lot of um, work on access for bariatric persons. So um, this, this is the, um, bariatric persons, this is the, the, the fastest growing segment of uh, accessibility. Um, in the world, really. Um, in Canada, we're expecting that uh, one in three um, people will soon be, um, you know, dealing with uh, this, this situation, which is essentially um, obesity, having a body mass index greater than 30. Um, interestingly, the stats show that there is a higher rate of um, obesity in rural areas than in urban areas by about um, 6%, which turns into one in three people versus one in four in, in urban areas. Um, so recognizing that this is a, a growing population um, and that sooner uh, or later, if, if it, it hasn't happened truly yet in the true sense of, of bariatric persons, but, but it will, like this is, this is definitely the, the future trend. We have anticipated that. Um, and of course, through the lens of universal design, this, there's a knock-on effect through the entire home of, um, increased or better access for people using mobility devices. So in the private room, we, we and uh, the tub and shower rooms, we have designed for um, a turning circle that approaches uh, a seven foot diameter, which is 2100 um, uh, diameter in millimeters. And we also have, wherever we have uh, common rooms like the multi-purpose room, sunrooms and terraces, the prayer room, we have, provided um, a, a wider door, uh, which is also, again, better when you have care support. And often, sometimes people are, are moving with not just themselves, but with someone uh, in accompaniment. Um, or for people using mobility devices, there's, there's just a, a, 
uh, wider space so that knuckles don't get grazed on walkers um, and uh, wheelchairs, carts, et cetera, going through um, is just easier. And level three assisted living, um, a, a different, slightly different population. We have uh, 40 units here, but again, in terms of the principles that we're using for physical mobility, uh, in terms of turning circles and access, uh, the principles remain the same. We have a combination in those 40 units of the studio, the one bedroom, and we have one bariatric resident for the 40 um, in, in that, in that um, combination. So now I'll talk a little bit about um, signage. Um, this, what you're looking at here is the signage design for the exterior. We're using high contrast colors and materials for messaging on all signs and incorporating a similar palette uh, on the signage that you saw in the images on the, of the rooms inside. So stone uh, and natural wood palette and relatively neutral and working within the neutral palette from, you know, using light reflectance values to create the contrast between the backgrounds and the, um, and the text. And then the scale, of course, will be, you know, appropriate to the specific um, application. The one on the far left is for the main driveway. And then we have wayfinding um, pylons, so to speak, these, these smaller signs through the site to indicate where the community plaza might be, um, parking, et cetera. And there will be signage on the building as well as on the main canopies. Then we have interior uh, signage. This is still under review, again, in the same palette. Um, and we're using contrast uh, and font size to make the signs legible. And the, our signage consultants at Forge Media are working with the interior design team to create a color palette to help with uh, wayfinding as well. So um, again, drawing uh, colors from, from nature, in particular, uh, the waterfalls in the area have created the um, basic inspiration for the, for the colors for each wing. So the strategy for, for signage is to create landmarks at key decision points um, so that we don't, we don't want to have too much signage because that creates um, a visual chaos, so to speak, um, and also to to cue people for when they can expect to see signage or expect to find signage so that there is a, um, you know, kind of no, not a random design, but something that's very planned and intentional. We also have all static signage. There's no digital signage. So there's nothing that's moving or flashing or changing rapidly. Um, and that's to address um, the, um, you know, the, the idea of accessibility in terms of cognition and memory. And this is the last slide, which is uh, basically a quote from one of our user group meetings um, about the, the core themes. And so certainly accessibility um, has been a, a core theme and consideration in the design of the building, both inside and, and out. Um, and I'd welcome any questions that you might have. I have a few. Okay. Anybody? Okay. Um, so I have um, a daughter that's in a wheelchair. So I do have a little bit of experience in uh, this kind of thing. And while the pandemic was on, uh, my job was non-essential. So I went and worked in a retirement home. Um, so a few things. Um, the pictures look great. Uh, the campfire has rocks around it. Is that like just for the picture or is that what you think that that's actually going to look like? It's not designed yet. It's um, it's the idea, the campfire represents an idea of what could be a in campfire. that Right. In that space. Okay. Yeah, because the thing we find about like our power, her power wheelchair is that literally I know concrete can be super like boring, but as soon as we put a pattern or you put rocks or anything anywhere, then the wheelchair just, it's, um, it's, and it's too hard for people to push like a manual chair, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, so smoother surfaces, like, uh, we've even done things like wood chips at the park. Like if they absorb water at all, they become slippery, all those kind of things. So I know concrete is not the prettiest thing, but 
really in the end, it's the best for everybody. Um, things like suggestions like uh, the roof garden, um, can some of the residents that are still cognitive have planters? Um, how do you mean? Like, so there's a roof garden, right? Like there's an area yes. where, right. Um, like, is there a way that residents can have a planter of their own to look after or can they be um, oh. like people that are, the people that live in a home are bored out of their marbles and I'm not going to yeah. lie. Yeah. yeah. They, they want to like help fold laundry. They want to like look after a planter. Yes. They want to like, yes. so can those things be accessible when you build them? Yes. They are. Okay. What I thought you were getting at was dedicated to each resident. No, um, no, no. That, okay. So, I, I mean, that's up to programming, but there certainly the idea is that the planters are accessible to residents for, for gardening. And, and there's a little, there will be a little, a tool shed, so to speak, that can be Perfect. locked up, but there will be tools and things like that. Um, and certainly a hose bib for watering and, and that. So the idea is to, is to get people busy and keep them busy. Right. So if we're going to plant, plant, we're going to build planters, let's make sure that they are usable by the residents who live there. Um, there's a common area, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I know like our common area had just a TV. So the people that were hard of hearing were always sitting like in front of the TV and blocking the other people. Is there a way that if the TV is on somewhere out, like a common area, if they have like a TV night kind of thing, um, hearing available. I know that'll be like an end thing, but that'll be something that you probably want to build in. Right. Which is kind of what they did in the great County building there when we went for uh, the chamber, like we went for the chamber tour there. Okay. Uh, so that kind of, I always felt like the deaf people were sitting in front of the TV and blocking everybody else around them. Right. Um, now you're providing furniture for every room that's being built. Uh, with the exception of the assisted living, which is a combination, I believe. Okay. Cause like, I know, <laughs> uh, hospital beds have been really, uh, difficult in our house to find, um, et cetera, one that actually fits. And I, I see, it feels like they're almost different to every patient slash slash resident, I guess. Uh, so my daughter has a literally $5,000 air mattress that doesn't cost or that doesn't cause uh, bed sores and it literally rotates all the time. So um, mm -hmm. if, you know, she was like a typical like senior and she was moving into a home and that's the kind of bed that she had, uh, would the bed that's in there accommodate something like that if something was to come along like that? That's the only reason I'm like, do we put a lot of money into furniture or do they want to take their own furniture? The other thing I've noticed a lot about seniors is, is they walk into a room and they honestly, uh, if they have Alzheimer's, they will walk into that room and they will look at all the furniture and believe that they don't live there. Mm -hmm. So there are rooms that are beneficial that those people take their own furniture. We're going through this with my mother-in-law right now. My uh, sister-in-law changed the wreath on my mother-in-law's door so that she knew which door was hers and tried to change the reef per season. And now my mother-in-law believes she doesn't live in that room. So there are things like that. If they wait too long to move in, those are just some of the things that I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we seem to do is every time we build a sink, we always put the tap at the back. So oh, there yeah. are those people that if they sit forward, don't necessarily can't reach the tap. Um, mm -hmm. I know we had a custom tap, a custom sink made for our house uh, so that the tap is actually further to the front. That is also a sensor tap. Right. Um, so we're finding that the back of the sink isn't actually always the answer. Um, the other thing that I saw was when uh, you walked into the common room where all the tables were, um, and one of the things I noticed when I worked at the seniors home was that every single table is the same height. Every kitchen table, everywhere where we eat is all the same height. And we had one little tiny lady who was in a manual chair and the manual chair was barely like she always sat really low at the table. And then we'd have some gentlemen that had a higher chair and they were sitting too high at the table. So does every table have to be the same height or can we have like the odd table height adjustable? Yeah, we, we do have, we have adjustable tables. Perfect. That was actually identified as, as potentially a safety issue. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. I think that's about it for me right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can't, I cannot stop sharing my screen. Does anybody know how I can get out of this? And then we can, uh, if you do have any other questions, though, please feel free to reach out because actually my, mom used, my mom used to work at Rockwood, funny enough, years ago. And uh, so anyway, so I don't know, having a kid with uh, a wheelchair gives you a whole different perspective. But let me know if there's, you know, anything that I kind of threw out there that you have any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Comments? Hi, it's Brooke. I have a question. On the signs, will, will there be Braille or some sort of tactile like writing of some sort? We, you know, we have um, only just um, looked at that very briefly in, in, in that um, on some projects, we, we have heard that people don't use Braille so much and others, people want to have it. And so I would actually like to hear from, from this group um, where, where on the spectrum um, this community would be in terms of that. I mean, certainly it's, it's at and around the elevator. Um, we know the best practices are to always have it, you know, in the same position in, in relation to the, uh, the latch side of the, of the door. Um, but by all means, um, we'd like to. I'd, I'd certainly like to hear um, what you'd like to see in in terms of uh, access for that. I think that we have to remember that, like all of us, like I'm in my early forties and I'm going to become older and I'm going to need. And I know Braille, so people like in my generation, and I know my mom who would have been sixty, early sixties, if she was still alive, that she also knew Braille, and a lot of people. So the people in our generations that are kind of going to be entering um, long term care, they're going to know Braille, and it's going to be a lot more, like the, a lot more used. Because mm -hmm. okay. if you don't have something that's auditory. Um, the, the, the only other option would be that they could press a button and see what the sign says, because you have to have something that somebody like me who's blind can see. Otherwise, it's not it's not really that's not really yeah. accessible. Yeah. OK, good to know. Thank you. Does Is anyone any else have any questions? I just had a question about the resident parking on the north end um, and wondered about accessible spots for that piece. We, we have the, um, we, we have not provided accessible parking on that side. Um, the idea was to, to group all of the accessible parking at the front entrance, uh, appreciating that it was not just accessibility, but there was also uh, a, a distance, which, um, you know, creates potentially a stamina issue as well. So we've we've put as much at the very front that we can. That was the approach that we took. Okay, the, the reason why I ask that is because it's for residents who have vehicles, but probably not all residents who have vehicles are going to um, be without accessibility needs. Correct. Yes. That's right. Um, I, I'm, I don't know what else to say. The, the, we have, we have um, are you suggesting that there would be, uh, the accessibility spots that we have would be moved or that would, we would have more? Um, what would the impact be of even just adding one in that lot? Oh, okay. We can take a look at that for sure. Can I, I, I was actually thinking about that because I just want to add to that, but it, I don't know if it necessarily, like it would be good to have like most residents that I've had to deal with that still had vehicles um, have an accessible parking pass. Um, the other thing about it would be, would those residents have uh, close to the door assigned parking spots? Right, like how far do you want to put them from the door? They 
are that that is their building. Um, is it every room going to need one? No. So it's going to have to change the sus like the sign will have to change versus who needs what. But every resident that I've had that's had a vehicle has also had a has a has had a pass. <laughs> I think assigning um, spots to people is certainly it's an operational aspect, not a not a design one per se. So um, it's possible that there could be, you know, kind of a survey of residents taken to see what the specific need is at that time. And that will that will change with time um, as well. There will there certainly I wouldn't expect a lot of the long-term care residents to be driving, but we did anticipate that some of the assisted living residents would. Andy, you had your hand up. Yes, I did. Um, just on the theme of parking, um, I, I think um, the facility should accommodate employees who uh, use wheelchairs too. So wherever the staff parking may be, um, certainly, that's been an issue for me over years, uh, going into a lot of long-term care facilities through my employment. We do, we have um, one barrier-free spot on the at, the at the staff entrance, and we have two additional ones associated with the village square that's that's very close to the um, staff entrance. So so we, we took that into account, at least in terms of the distribution of, of the, um, accessible parking spots around the site. And the, uh, just related to that issue specifically, uh, um, and I'm just talking, it's funny, uh, I still, um, I've been retired for a couple of years, but I've, now I voluntarily manage, so I'm in there a couple of days. And uh, the keypads are all at a height where someone who cannot raise themselves up in their wheelchair or stand up, um, they're not accessible. Okay. I'll, just, I'll make a note of that. Thank you. So we would, um, I guess the, as a principle, we could um, design the keypads and, you know, in, in keeping with the maximum height levels of, of other accessibility controls. Right? Yeah, because often they, um, they are placed because there's often side windows around the door. Um, I mean, aesthetically to improve the, you know, the visual um, and being able to look out or look in. But uh, it's almost like an afterthought often where they put those keypads and I realize those are older, like the Manor, many of the entrances are older, but um, they're not in a convenient spot, regardless of height. It's just not, I mean, you cannot get your foot pedals close enough to it to access the button. So it's, um, they're, I don't know if there is standards now around where those keypads should be, but um, more often than they're not, they're where they should not be. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know about Lehman. It's possible they were retrofitted, in which case they put them where they could. Well, in most cases, I'm talking about that is the case. Yeah. I understand. But, but this is, yeah, no, this is purpose built. So um, so that's a that's a very good um, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's Those are my uh, comments. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions? I want to thank you, Deborah and Andrew, for your presentation. And um, from my perspective, it the building is beautiful. Um, you know, it looks like in the design aspect of it, you've thought of everything. Um, you know, obviously, there's the minimum of the uh, built environment standard in the building code that you've obviously followed, but you've gone above and beyond that in most cases of the design of the building, which is really impressive to see. And um, I, I mean, certainly taking into consideration the um, items that uh, Brooke and Andy and Christina brought up, um, if there's a chance that those could be incorporated in it, I think those are very valuable and extremely important because um, we're not really looking at current and we're looking at future as well and based on the statistics of the amount of people who will have disabilities or aging related physical disabilities um, we have to prepare for that right in any buildings that are being built today 
Absolutely. I, yeah. I've taken notes on everybody's comments. And so um, I, I, I might reach out through uh, Andrew or Randy to, to people to clarify things if, if, uh, if it comes up again. So thank you very much. You're welcome. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And thanks again for your presentation today. Thank you. That was a uh, very insightful. I enjoyed that. Thanks very much, everyone, for your, thanks, your everyone. input and participation and comments. It's excellent. Oh. Thank you. Sorry, Randy, I forgot you. Um, no, but... no, it's, I, I truly appreciate uh, all the comments and feedback that we heard today. And uh, um, as Deborah noted, I, I took notes as well. So, um, so between uh, Andrew, Deborah, and myself, we'll uh, we'll for sure take these these comments and considerations in terms of the final design. And uh, and if we have any further questions, we'll follow up with uh, with the committee members. So, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, Sarah, do we have a motion prepared? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes. Uh, I would oh, be happy sorry, to Sarah. <laughs> uh, uh, would, if it would be helpful, I would be happy to read it um, for your consideration. Yes, please. Uh, so that the presentation from the County of Gray dated March 22nd, 2023, regarding the Rockwood Terrace redevelopment be presented for review and comment. Okay, do we have that a mover for the motion? I'll do it. That's Brooke. Okay, Brooke. And a seconder, Andy? Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Great. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move back to uh, the top of the agenda. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the updated terms of reference for the Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. And do we have a motion on that as well, Sarah? For you, Madam Chair, yes, we do. Um, it provides that the report regarding the updated terms of reference for the Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee be received, and that the updated Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee terms of reference be endorsed and adopted as presented. Okay, and can I have a mover on that? Andrea? And a seconder. Andy, thank you. And I will hand it over to Kathy. Okay, thank you, everybody. And, and Chair Schultz, nice to see you back in the chair. Um, with the new term of council, the terms of reference for all of the subcommittees and accessory committees um, we felt it was a good time to give those a review and a once over. So um, not a whole lot has changed with what was presented here today, um, mostly housekeeping really. Um, but if anybody has any thoughts on anything that's missing or anything that should be removed, I'd be interested to hear about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I read it over and it's wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, the slight changes that were made um, certainly reflect uh, the terms of reference for sure, Kathy. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you for presenting and um, all in favor of our motion. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the second item is the Gray County Accessibility Compliance Report and Kathy is presenting on that as well, but there will be another motion. So Sarah, I'll get you to read the motion. And through you, Madam Chair, uh, this report provides that the Accessibility Compliance Report uh, be received and that the 2023 Accessibility Compliance Report uh, be endorsed as submitted to the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. Okay, and can I get a mover on the motion? I'll do it, it's Brooke. Okay, and a seconder? Christina, thank you. And I'll hand it over to you, Kathy. Okay, thank you. So normally the accessibility compliance reports are due at the end of the year, every other year. 
um, but we received um, a message from the province with a very tight deadline, such that there was no opportunity to bring anything for consideration by this committee or county council. Um, in 2019, Gray County reported as being compliant. In 2020, 21, we uh, were non-compliant in two areas. One was IT with the requirement for the WCAG 2.0, and the other one is for transit, which um, we didn't have prior to 2020. So um, what ended up happening was because we had been working toward compliance already, we were in a position to submit a compliant report um, which you have before you. And so um, that was submitted and um, there are still areas where we are working to improve, but um, we are compliant. And um, I think that's basically it for the overview. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Oh, looks like Harley's got her hand up. You're, you're on mute, Carly, if you're wanting to participate. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah, Andrew, you had your hand up. Yeah, and I'm sorry, this um, just um, an observation going back to the terms of reference. I realize we've already discussed that. Um, but it's interesting that I believe it's the Accessibility Advisory Committee and they changed the word advise throughout the terms of reference. I just thought that was an interesting observation. What did I change it to? <laughs> um, comment, review and comment? Yes, I believe so. Okay, because that, that's the uh, ministry's uh, requirement that there be review and comment by the committee. So that's why I changed it. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. To, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I just thought that was an interesting observation. That, you know, it's actually the name of our committee, but um, it's been removed from our terms of reference. Yeah, yeah, very true. Well, that was the province who declared that they would be advisory committees and the participation be review and comment. Well, nothing good comes out of a provincial level. <laughs> That's great. And I saw that Carly um, mentioned that she didn't have her hand up. So thanks for the, um, the communication there, Carly. Okay. Um, all in, I'm going to ask for um, all in favor of our motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next item on, <laughs> Kathy, you're on a roll here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next item on the agenda is the, up, uh, sorry, the update on membership of the Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee. And do we have a motion on that as well, Sarah? Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Yes, we do. That the report uh, regarding Gray County Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee membership be received for information. Okay, and can I get a mover on that motion? Andrea and a seconder. Christina, thank you. And okay. I will hand it over to Kathy. <laughs> thank you, Chair Schultz. Um, this could have just been a reference document, but I wanted to particularly thank the members of this committee. Um, for everybody put their name in the hat to continue on for another term of council. And I'm truly grateful because um, I think it's a tremendous committee and everyone gives such wonderful um, input and I value you and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That's amazing. And um, I don't think we could do it without you. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, um, so can I have um, all in favor of our motion? Thank you. And our next item on the agenda is Gray Road 18. Um, 
Canadian Pacific Rail Trail parking lot, and that is Natalie Mac. I'm sorry, I don't want to pronounce your last name wrong. I'm just going to say Natalie. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to share my screen here. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the um, Gray Road 18 CP Rail Trail parking lot project that the planning department is undertaking. Um, we're undertaking this project in partnership with Transportation Services, and um, the county has received requests from different trail user groups for designated rail trail parking. Um, and this specific location was chosen um, for a few reasons, one being um, the locations on the road right of way or the trail right of way, sorry. And um, another one being that this is uh, where the portion of the trail becomes motorized um, from Gray Road 18 to Dundalk. And there's also uh, Bruce Trail access if you travel on the CP Rail Trail about a kilometer north, um, you'll reach the Sydenham Nature Reserve and um, you can access the Bruce Trail from there. So I have an image on the slide here just to give an idea of where the proposed parking lot location is. Uh, there's Highway 6 to the west. So if you're traveling down Highway 6 south of Owen Sound, you reach uh, Rockford and the Gray Road 18 intersection and then uh, head east along Gray Road 18 for approximately 300 meters. You'll come up to the CP Rail Trail and that's just denoted in the uh, red dashed line on the slide. And the trail, it runs parallel to Highway 6 and um, the parking area denoted in the yellow rectangle is um, within the trail right of way just south of Gray Road 18. Um, currently, there's a little gravel area area there where maybe two or three cars can fit maximum. So the new lot uh, will remain gravel and it will have space to accommodate 15 vehicles. Um, the lot, the slope of the lot will be 1%, so it's similar to the rail trail. Um, and then there's a proposed three meter wide um, gravel pedestrian path near the lot entrance so that users can access the trail and um, Kind of next to that proposed access will be a swale uh, to help with drainage. And as I mentioned earlier, this project is being completed in partnership with Transportation Services. Um, they'll be doing some construction on Gray Road 18 and um, they'll be able to extend the current parking area that's there through constructing this um, new gravel lot. So it's just a, just a quick overview of, of the project that we're looking at, um, but I'm happy to take any questions, comments, or feedback. Um, and thank you for your time today. Do we have any questions? Oh, Andrea, yes, please. Hi. Um, it, uh, through you, the chair, I I understand that this this parking lot is gravel because the the rail uh, network right there is gravel as well. But it, so, in a more general context, within Gray County, um, are there identified areas where trails are um, are paved, have paved strips to them, um, paved segments to them, uh, so that people can use them with with all sorts of mobility? I, th this is a question that's been coming up here in our town, and I want to be able to be able to um, consider our our town in the greater context of Gray County and and be aware I would I would love to be able to go tour them I would like to go find them and and be able to um, get a bigger picture of where people can be able to enjoy trail use when they may have difficulty in gravel especially this time of year when wheels start digging in so um, perhaps based on this particular topic you could illuminate me on where we are since I'm I'm the new kid on the block here in this in this group. <laughs> 
Oh, and I'm from the town of the Blue Mountains too, in case, uh, cause I, I don't know everyone here in the group. So I'm asking from, from what we've been talking about here in the town of Blue Mountains, but how it fits into the bigger picture in Gray County. Yeah, thank you for your question, Councillor Matrosofs, and um, through the chair. To my knowledge, um, there aren't any current areas that have paved entrances to trails um, based on the county forest trails. A lot of them have been identified as, as wilderness trails with um, limited infrastructure at this time, um, but we are looking at um, different parking areas and, and different up upgrades to those um, trails. So it's definitely something that we can look into and consider. Um, but yes, to my knowledge, I don't believe within um, the county forest and trails, there are any of those accesses. However, within separate municipalities, um, I'm unfortunately a little bit less familiar with those, but there may be some identified uh, spots there. I know um, in Hanover, they have a, a trail system down that way. Um, however, I can't confirm whether they, they do have those uh, um, cement accesses. Okay, so Madam Chair, is this something within the realm of the work of, of our Gray County Joint Advisor, uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee that we could explore? Because if we're all independently asking that question, where can one find some, some trails that, that I can use with my family members, for example? Um, you know, is this the right venue? Is this the right, does that fall within the mandate of this group that we might strike up together and start sharing with each other across the nine municipalities who has, um, you know, who, who has, who has what, where, and so that we could share that with the greater population? Um, Kathy, can I get you to answer that question? Sure, through you, Chair. Um, so there are a couple of projects in place, and one is um, a GIS project where um, municipal accessible features are mapped and identified. This was a project that was coming close to being complete um, just prior to COVID, and then we had COVID and some staffing changes, and so that project um, halted for a bit, but it is on our multi-year plan to look at. And um, in conjunction, conjunction with Natalie and planning staff, um, Natalie's looking after trails and then Becky and Hiba are looking after the age-friendly um, project. There are some things there where this can be dovetailed into. And I think, um, on a kind of a high level they're being considered, but I love that idea. And I think that um, we can grow that municipal accessible features map definitely. And um, separately, I think there is there are trails maps that we can um, work toward identifying accessible features there as well. Not a lot of our trails that are um, county run are accessible at the moment. Some are um, getting more accessible features like benches and lighting and rest st stops and signage. Um, so we're definitely, it's on the radar to work toward that for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I, I handed it over to you because I knew you had some background experience on that. So thank you for your answer on that. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Natalie? No. Do we have a motion, Sarah? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, yes, we do. That the report from the County of Gray dated March 22nd regarding uh, 2023 regarding the Gray Road 18 CP Rail Trail parking lot be presented for review and comment. Okay, can I get a mover? Andy? I can do this, Brooke. Oh, second, Brooke. Okay. And yep. all in favor? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, for your presentation. Okay. The next item on the agenda is Gray Highlands Multi Year Accessibility Plan for the years 2023 to 2027. And Debbie Yip will be presenting and we do have a motion. I'll get Sarah to read that motion. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the motion uh, for this matter is that the report from the municipality of Gray Highlands regarding the multi-year accessibility plan dated 2023 to 2027 be presented for review and comment. And can I have a mover on the motion? Andrea and a seconder. Christina, thank you. And I will hand it over to you, Debbie. Thank you, Chair Catherine. That's for you to the committee. I think the uh, five-year plan is pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's too much in here that needs uh, clarification, but I'm happy to field any questions. Um, I have met with all the SMT members and gone through all of their areas of responsibility, looking at what can we do over the next five years. And this document is the result of those conversations. Is, does anybody want to go anywhere in particular, or do you want me to take you through the document? I don't think it's necessary. I'm, um, I just, I'm just going to ask the members, um, has everyone reviewed the document? Andy, Christina? Okay. Did you want Debbie to go through the document? Okay. How about you, Brooke? Oh, um, I'm good. Okay. Thanks, Brooke. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate it. I read through the report, um, and thank you very much for all your work on that. And I, I just want to thank the group. I really echo what Kathy and Nuno said about this group. Um, I I am kind of off topic here. I do get a bit frustrated with some people that don't understand the value of this group, especially developers. And so when things are thrown over the fence to my area and there's no explanation, like, like I can't, like I'm not an engineer. You know, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not the like people that were presenting earlier, they're designers and, you know, they've got all of that language. And so I'm trying to work really hard because Mark Dale and Gray Hunt is going through a real growth period and I'm trying to get all the developers to understand that I really want to bring some plans forward to this group. So um, I just want you to kind of trust me that I'm doing some work on the background to bring more things to you. So thank you for your commitment and dedication to this. Thank you, thank you Debbie. We appreciate that. And we appreciate the work that you're doing as well. Um, you know, as you said, hopefully pushing some things through to this committee. Um, and I, you know, I agree with your sentiments on that. Um, having had lots of experience um, in accessibility and, you know, working with builders and developers in my past, um, it can be challenging to say the least. And that's where the, ex, you know, the built environment when it became law under the building code um, has really um, catapulted everything around the accessibility, but I still strive for we can do better. And certainly the building code to me is the minimum. Um, it's so we can do a lot better um, and moving forward on, um, you know, you know, sort of extenu ex I, I don't know what the word is, but anyway, um, just expanding on that and building on you know, making the building code even better than what it is right now. And it's our group, it's all of the joint accessibility advisory committees across the province that, you know, has the opportunity to push that, you know, and make sure that uh, we're going above and beyond the building code. So thank you, Debbie, for all your work. We appreciate it. And okay, so can I get um, all in favor of the motion? Thank you. And the next item on the agenda is uh, Georgian Bluffs. This is a verbal update of past and upcoming projects. And Niall? That's it, yep. Yeah. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And thank you for the welcome. Yeah, yeah, Niall. Um, you, oh, sorry. you pronounced it. No, you pronounced it absolutely fine. It gets okay. pronounced all kinds of crazy different ways at various different, <laughs> uh, different times in my life. So um, you did, you did spot on. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so 
so I am remarkably unprepared compared to the rest of the rest of your um, delegations today. I have I don't think there's a motion that accompanies me. Um, uh, uh, and so I'm really, I really wanted to come and meet the committee and say hello. I'm a new member of staff at the, uh, well, I don't think I get to call myself new anymore. I started in November last year, um, member of staff uh, over at the Township of uh, Georgian Bluffs um, in, a, in a relatively new role um, as, as the director of the community services team here. Um, I'm sure you've heard from my colleagues in the past at various different times, um, but the facility side of um, uh, the the township's work um, now falls under under the sort of the community services side of things. So I look after help look after parks and trails, um, and I also look, help look after and and steward the buildings and facilities uh, that we have. So. Um, the uh, the arena at Shallow Lake and the two community centre former arenas at, at Derby and um, up in up in Campbell as well. So, um, as I say, it's a new team, new department. Well, not new team, uh, old team, um, uh, new department, new new structure, um, and and finding our way through that. So I'm I'm looking forward to working with this group. I've had the pleasure of working with accessibility groups now in, in several different places and and. Uh, as some of your other other delegates this afternoon have shared, uh, I found that the insight and wisdom of of groups, the accessibility teams I've had an opportunity to work with, been um, extremely instrumental in the in the work that I'm doing. So so thank you um, in advance. Uh, I'm sure um, for for the, the the support and advice that that you'll be able to um, uh, provide to and input into projects as we go forward. Um, I did want to share a, a, a quick update on a couple of projects that are coming, and I can share greater details with these with the group if if there is if there's need for it or if there's a desire to see it. Um, but we are working on a couple of projects with accessibility specifically in mind, focused on some of our our parks and and, and open spaces in the township. Uh, and so the first one of those is we're hoping this year, uh, we started this work last year, but hoping this year to um, complete work at Sarawak Family Park, which is out on Grey Road 1, uh, just opposite the Legacy Golf Course as you're coming out of Owen Sound there. Um, Sarawak Family Park um, has probably our best beach access uh, in the township. Um, and uh, there were some recent upgrades done there with the uh, uh, was it Fellowship of Good Cheer, I think it was, that um, helped fund the um, accessibility, uh, fund some improvements to uh, the washrooms that are in the, the parking lot there. And the uh, parking lot has recently been paved and, and lined. Um, but beyond the parking lot, it's very difficult to move because it's all just grass after that. And so um, it's not a steep park, but there is a bit of a gradient that runs from the top of the park to the base. And so we've had a trail designed, which will be a hard surface paved trail, which will link from the parking lot um, and washroom complex down through the park, um, uh, achieving uh, between two and no more than 4% um, slope. Um, uh, down through the park to the shoreline um, and link through to uh, the the play features that are there um, to aid accessibility through the park landscape. And then we're also hoping to invest, and I know a number of municipalities have done this. We have a sandy shore um, at the at the, uh, the 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 lake edge there, where people can get down into the river, into the lake, sorry, um, into the bay, uh, and it's quite a nice gentle slope. Um, once you hit the water, so there's a, a fairly gentle egress in into the bay. Um, so we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to put some beach mats, the Moby mats down um, to provide for firmer footing underfoot for anyone that's unfirm on their feet or indeed anyone that might be um, uh, using wheels to roll down um, to be able to access the shore. So we're hoping that that work will be completed this year. We're also hoping as we go through that to add a couple more accessible seating areas. So like seating that you can get to without having to cross you know, acres of grass or anything else like that, um, and uh, invest in a couple of of um, uh, accessibility um, uh, accessible uh, tables, tables, um, picnic tables, which you can roll a wheelchair up to and actually sit at the table um, uh, rather than having to perch awkwardly off one end. Um, uh, and so we're, we're hoping to have those installed a little later on this year. So a couple of improvements at that location. Um, uh, uh, the second location that we're, we're really putting some time in this year um, is in Kilsyth. Um, 
And so um, if you know Kilsyth, we have the Derby Community Centre, which is a sort of the, the highest point in the village there. Um, as part of the new development that's occurring along Fleming Drive, um, there's a, a, a small uh, park that the township um, has achieved through the development. Uh, it's not got anything in it in a minute. It's just a piece of land just now. Um, but over the next, uh, probably the next month, six weeks or so, a playground will be put in there, um, accessed off Fleming Drive. Um, there's no parking associated with the playground itself, and it's on a bit of a bend in the road. So it would be a challenge to park and access that playground um, uh, for, for residents that needed to get there by car. Um, but we're going to be putting in, there's quite an extensive parking lot at the Derby Community Centre. And so there will be a trail which is going to be created down a quite a steep hill. Um, so there's quite a lot of grading work that's going to be done to cut into the bank to try and achieve as uh, as accessible. I think we've achieved 4%, no more than 4% slope um, on an asphalt trail that will run from the parking lot next to the Derby Community Centre down to Lincoln uh, to that park and play area and provide an accessible connect connection uh, for pedestrians and, and, and rollers between the, uh, between the, the new park that's being formed uh, and the community centre up at the top. And again, um, uh, we will be, uh, and I've been involved in, in multiple debates on this, and I appreciate that it is not fully accessible, but according to the standards, wood chip, um, uh, the EWF, the engineered wood fiber um, uh, will be placed in the playground, which will make it one of the more accessible playgrounds we have in the township just now, because um, we still have pea gravel and sand in some of our others, which are, uh, are even worse than wood chip. And I do appreciate the engineered wood fiber is, is not as accessible as, as, as some other surfaces are, particularly the rubberized, um, the rubberized surfaces. Um, so we will have a, a new playground playground there, which will be one of our more accessible playgrounds um, in the township. And then the last thing, uh, as a bit of an update, we are trying to do um, a little bit of work in, in uh, several of the smaller green spaces we have, so Centennial Park um, and Cedar Hill Park, um, to provide for seating opportunities which are more accessible than we currently have. So a lot of our parks, you basically exit your car um, or vehicle um, and you're onto grass surface then and uh, or, or onto a cobble beach, a, a, a beach environment. And so we are going to try and um, uh, improve some of the accessible seating. We've got a funding application that we're hoping um, will allow us to do some work to create link paths to seating areas so that people uh, that have mobility challenges and, and, and for whom uneven uneven terrain might be a challenge, we'll be able to access some of the seating areas and not just simply be restricted to visiting some of our parks and, and having to sit in a car because there isn't anywhere else they can get to. Um, so there's a few things that we're, we're hoping to do this year and I wanted to share those, but I also wanted to, more important I think than sharing the updates was say, hello, I'm here. Um, and uh, I, I am, I'm, you know, it's a new body of work for the township. And uh, if there are if there are things that um, you feel the township could be working on, I'm delighted to uh, delighted to take any of that back and and uh, noodle away on it as as I start get my feet um, more firmly established underneath the desk. So thank you very much for the introduction and, and and invite. I'm quite happy to take any questions on any of those projects. But it was really just to say hello. I'm here, and uh, and if there is anything. Um, please feel free to reach out. Okay, so Kathy, you have a question? Yeah, so for the design of public spaces, in order to, uh, for Georgian Bluffs to be comp compliant with the, um, the, the, the reaching out piece for review and comment, I'm hopeful that our committee members today will be able to provide some comments, even though there have been, um, no drawings or pictures to look at, but I think Niall explained them fairly well. And um, we want to make sure that this public input piece is, is adequately addressed. And some of these projects look like they're very soon coming down the pipe. Yeah, so I can certainly share drawings. So we have technical drawings now for um, uh, both the two trail projects. So I'm quite happy to share those um, and, and circulate after after the uh, after this meeting's gone forward. Um, when's the next meeting? Where, how often how often does the group meet? Through you, the Chair. Next, we, uh, yeah. we meet we meet um, fairly routinely and as needed. Okay, so we've probably got plenty of time actually to, to receive comments back. So I can share the drawings for the two trails that we've got. We haven't got, we're preparing tender documents at this point in time. Um, they're both funded 
supported through um, grant funds. So there is a little bit of a pressure on time for getting these out, um, but we haven't got a tender document done yet. And so, you know, we're, we're certainly, uh, and we're not in the right season yet to be building these. I wouldn't anticipate that we're going to be seeing shovels in the ground probably until June. So we've got time for um, some comment back on the drawing. So I will circulate those um, uh, after this meeting and then you can circulate them as you see fit through the group. Uh, and I'll, I'll, if I could be possibly, um, join the next meeting, perhaps I'll be a little bit more organized. There'll be some information in the pack and, and maybe a, a, a more robust conversation once you've had a chance to look at them. Okay, thank you, Niall, and through you, Chair. Um, so we do these through agenda review. So um, we will include those with the next, with the next agenda. Perfect, Thanks. thank you. Okay, thank you, Niall. We certainly appreciate you coming to the committee and giving us an update and welcome aboard at uh, Georgian Bluffs. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. Okay. So we can move on to the next item, which is reference documents, which we do not have. Um, and then other business. So the first item under other business is an update on the September 14th 2022 regional accessibility advisory chair meeting and i have to unfortunately say that i did not attend the meeting um i was left off <laughs> unfortunately i was overlooked um so um i contacted the, um i believe it was jennifer parker and um, unfortunately, they did not have me on the list. And so therefore, I did not receive any of the information uh, leading up to the meeting. And um, so, I mean, I, I called because I wanted to see, first of all, you know, I had a rough idea when the meeting was scheduled, um, but the meeting had already taken place. Um, so I will be invited in the future. Um, it was just a, it was a, you know, not even a mistake. I think it was just the timing, you know, it just, yeah, uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, it would, I just got missed. Yeah. So it would have been nice to have come to the committee today and, and done an update, but unfortunately I don't have any information to, to share. Um, the next item is transit. How can we make it better? Uh, that was Andrew. Um, Kathy, did Andrew submit anything on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I think it was just going to be a discussion item. And I did send Andrew um, an email at the beginning of the meeting to say, do you need help logging in, blah, blah, blah. So I don't think he's available because he didn't reply to me. So maybe we can bump this to the next meeting. Okay, definitely. Okay, and then the next item um, is the UHN Kite Research Institute's Wayfinding Technology Survey, and I will hand that over to Kathy. Thank you. So um, I just wondered if anybody had had opportunity to, um, to talk about that one or to participate in it at all. I did it. So I did that survey. It's broke. Thanks, Brooke. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting there for some reason. So yeah. did you find it a valuable exercise or did you have any thoughts about it? Um, I didn't find it very useful, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just didn't find it very useful as a blind person. Okay, it thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another one out, and I've included it in the package. Um, it's Have Your Opinion Heard CSA Accessible Dwellings Survey. So the CSA is the Canadian Standards Association, and they do have like a great um, publication called Accessible Design for the Built Environment. And I've um, I've circulated bits of it here and there to people as needed. It's it's very well laid out. The whole document is accessible. It's available in print and online. It includes a lot of um, diagrams and explanations and definitions. 
And I guess they're updating that. And so there's a survey, it's very brief. I think maybe our municipal partners particularly might be interested in um, doing this survey and the deadline for that is May 31st. Okay. The CSA um, Accessible Design for Built Environment, that document is a, a, an amazing document. Um, I use that document uh, to assist me in audits of buildings uh, prior to the built environment standard being, um, you know, revised in the, the Ontario Building Code. It's been around a long time, and I do believe that uh, the built environment um, standard in the building code used their document as a guideline um to make those changes that they did um so it's it is and i'm sure their survey will be um equally well done as well yeah okay thank you kathy so the next item is we're basically wrapping up the meeting and our next meeting will be on june the first at one o'clock Everybody fine with that? Through you, Madam Chair, that was one of the dates that had previously been circulated to the committee by email. And it seemed at the time that the majority of members were available for that date. And uh, uh, Councillor Matrasov, I see that your hand has been raised. The only other thing I was perhaps going to add is that we've exceeded received a number of expressions of interest now in bringing additional materials before the committee. Um, and I was perhaps going to look into arranging for a May meeting date instead, just to try to bring that date a little closer um, and uh, um, kind of capture some of the items from some of the member municipalities that I know have uh, things that they would like to bring before you, but uh, uh, were not captured in the March meeting package timelines. So um, perhaps uh, instead of the June date being posted as as finalized, I'll I'll uh, take uh, I'll undertake another poll to look into a May meeting date instead. Okay, that sounds great, Sarah. And I wondered about that because um, with the update, the verbal update from Georgian Bluffs, it would appear that um, they're anxious to get feedback from this committee um, before June, um, yes. which it looks like, you know, if they're going to proceed, that is likely when they're going to make those changes in, in the months of maybe even end of May, beginning of June. So, yeah. I think uh, a meeting in May is appropriate. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Councillor Matrasov, did that uh, satisfy um, your, your scheduling comments as well? <laughs> yeah, because I was going to say, I, I do have a conflict with the, the 1st of June. Um, I would start with this meeting, but then have to split my time with the Attainable Housing Corporation here. So um, I, it sounds like maybe that's not going to be the date anyway. So so let's just wait and see. Um, and Sarah, if you ever need to um, check in about my schedule, uh, uh, um, Kyra here, Kyra Dunlop, the deputy clerk, she's responsible for my calendar. So she knows that if there's a blank space, she can book it. So <laughs> if you need some feedback, um, but I recognize that I'm probably going to be one of the more intricate schedules to try to accommodate. So that when they're booked early and in advance, that really helps because then I can say, hey, hands off. I've already got this one booked. <laughs> so yes, um, the, the sooner the notice, the better so that I can prioritize this committee. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I think the hope is that uh, June will give our member municipalities a lot of time to, to prepare some great material for us. Um, and the May window will provide opportunity to um, receive feedback from the committee before shovels kind of start to hit the ground as uh, as the season warms. So mm -hmm. I, I will definitely undertake that poll and we'll see about getting that next meeting date set. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. And I just wanted to say as chair um, of the committee, thank you again for putting me in this position. I do appreciate it and I do enjoy it. And I also wanted to welcome, which I should have done at the beginning of the meeting, is to welcome um, my mayor, 
of my municipality of the town of the Blue Mountains, Andrea Mastervos, to this committee. We're looking forward to having you on the committee, Andrea, and working with you. Okay. And I believe we're able to adjourn. So it was lovely seeing everyone again. It's been so long. <laughs> and uh, have a great balance of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.